my great pleasure, great honor to welcome to our seminar, Professor Ingrid Obeshi from Duke University. Professor Obeshi is a, a great scientist in applied mathematics with a huge impact in different areas. So in particular in inverse problems, harmonic analysis, but also in optimization. So working uh, at the intersection of these fields. So is uh, you know, one of the most prominent researchers uh, working in, in these areas. So I'm, I'm very glad and very happy that she accepted our invitation. And uh, of course, I noticed in the, yeah, in the list of participants, many friends from, from different areas that these are not, not only, let's say yeah, our uh, clients, yeah, our, our regular clients, uh, many, many colleagues from, from these other fields. So welcome to our seminar, Professor Dobishi, the stage is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for the kind invitation. And uh, I am, and uh, uh, hello to everybody uh, in, in, in the audience, especially old friends. And uh, maybe an apology to uh, the people who are the standard audience of this optimization series seminar in that I'm not an optimizer. And I, I have uh, uh, this particular talk, although there is some optimization in it, is, is not really uh, mainstream optimization. Um, and well, I such you'll get it such as it is. So uh, this actually is an overview of uh, a program that has uh, uh, occupied me and uh, my 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 young collaborators uh, for about ten years. I mean, and it has evolved. It's a project that has evolved as we as we worked on it. And so the talk will also be in part the story of uh, how that happened. Okay, low dimensional manifolds and very high dimensional data sets is something we all do. Um, and it is, the problem is uh, in, 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 in a nutshell, uh, if you have something that looks like this two dimensional, that well, this rendering of a two dimensional surface in 3D, then uh, our visual system is very good at that. But if it's in much higher dimension, it's not so easy. And, uh, we uh, the strategy we uh, we use in order to uh, uh, find them is uh, to use uh, diffusion maps and development of those. So the idea is that uh, if you have your data points in high dimension and they're uh, um, sitting and you have a reasonably dense uh, a sampling, then you can uh, use the local distances uh, to, to uh, uh, I mean, and you need, need local distances to go back to my example here. If I take, do you see my mouse? Yes. Yes. Okay, if you take points on this surface, then it's clear that the distance from this point to that point is, is really measuring along the geodate here. Uh, and, but if you take in the three dimensional space, you get a wrong distance. For points that are very close, you're typically quite, quite quite reasonable because uh, well it's a Riemannian manifold and so what happens is that uh, closed distances closed geodetic distances are very close to uh, uh, the the distances in in uh, to the, the, the Euclidean distances because the Euclidean distances are close to what you would get with the exponential map on the tangential plane and um, so the idea is that you can try to knit together little neighborhoods. On, on little neighborhoods, you, uh, uh, you diffuse. And then when, uh, because they overlap, you can jump from one to the other. And so you would, fall, you would follow via diffusion, little local diffusions, much longer paths by doing this hopping. And <laughs> this is a... Uh, 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 that illustrates it uh, uh, well in, 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 in a more playful sense. Every one of the places on, these, uh, many, on these, these surfaces is covered with a little sequin, which is a little flat disk. And together, all these sequins give you a very good imagine, a, a picture of the whole surface, even though it's just a union of little flat disks. And similarly, that's what we're doing well, what I view we are doing when we do diffusion geometry, you you um, you take the little little disks. Well, I have been elongated here to make the overlap easier, um, and and you uh, uh, 
you do diffusion as if you were in the uh, ambient uh, Euclidean space. You build, uh, 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 you, you, you make it possible to hop together. So that now makes it possible to make very long uh, 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 stretches. And so you can make a path from points that are very far removed and diffuse. Um, so in practice, what does that mean? It means that if you have a vertex, then, um, and you have other vertices, then you have all these distances, dij. Uh, we build the, uh, uh, the matrix of the, uh, uh, of the diffusion as if it were a uh, Euclidean diffusion for very small tau. Uh, you, it, because different vertices have different numbers of, mate, of, of neighbors, you need to uh, normalize so that you actually do indeed get a, 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 a matrix by this diagonal uh, normalization, uh, this diagonal uh, sum, and then uh, normalizing in that way, you get something that is a, a, a random walk on a graph. Um, there's a question about how do you pick, pick tau? People who use this method often say that it's more, uh, it's as much an art as a science. But in fact, uh, uh, together with my former student, Shan Shan, um, we, we realized that the, the method itself gives you an idea of how to pick tau. You want to pick tau as large as possible that's still compatible with the method because you don't want, if you take tau very small, then nothing diffuses. You just stay where you are. Um, if, if, so you want to pick tau as large as possible, but you can't pick tau too large because then you're giving too much uh, importance to uh, distances, Euclidean distances that you know are wrong. Uh, are wrong. So you, you, you do need this uh, decay, this Gaussian decay of the matrix in order to downplay distances that are too large. So uh, what you want is a, a, a diffusion operator. A diffusion operator has a semi-group property. Namely, if you concatenate it for two different times, then you get a diffusion for the combined time. So uh, what we do is we pick a tau that is as large as possible. And so that the diffusion matrix that we propose is uh, one squared, very close to what you would get for two tau. So we look at the discrepancy between those two. And as long as that discrepancy is small, we say tau is, is reasonable. And you stop when, when, when you, you, you take tau as large as possible uh, within that constraint. And that works well for us. Now, once you've done that in practice, I mean, I was talking about concatenating. Of course, you don't concatenate. Because what happens is that if you have a matrix that for small tau gives you the diffusion, uh, then uh, that operator is the operator that has a spectral decomposition of the diffusion operator. So you find its eigenvectors and their eigenvalues, and then taking the decomposition into the eigenvectors and giving, taking different powers of the eigenvalues will give you diffusion for a different time. And so uh, what you do, in fact, when you do this is because, of course, you truncate after a certain number of, of eigenvectors, because the higher you go in the order of the eigenvector, the noisier your, your uh, 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 the more impact uh, noise it has on, 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 on your uh, decomposition. So what you do is you... Uh, look at, at uh, a way of denoising the operator you build by telling it it has to have this particular, uh, uh, um, this particular, these particular properties. So it's a, a very nonlinear way of denoising. And then what you can do is you can uh, use this in order to uh, uh, to a dimension reduction where you attach for each data point the corresponding uh, entry of 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 of, uh, of the uh, uh, of of the, the 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 vector here. Uh, I mean, by taking this, you get that this is like an inner product, and uh, that gives you a way of of, of computing then uh, distances that correspond to that. Okay, so um, we did this for uh, data to, that I will describe in a second to you. And um, we had done an approach that we were already very proud of about 10 years ago that clustered uh, in a distance that we defined in, in uh, 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 a data 
uh, uh, consistent way on a data set that consisted of, of uh, five groups of 10 individuals each colored in this, this diagram. And uh, uh, the biologists with whom we were working were already very pleased with this clustering, but with exactly the same data. So no change. Uh, we Diffusion distance gives you the clustering that is shown here on the right. So that shows the power of this method. I mean, and we kept telling the biologists, don't worry about the things that have long distances, we don't trust them. And they only heard us with half an ear and they said, yeah, well, it's mathematicians talk. But when we showed them the diagram on the right, they became converts. Okay, so, um, so this was the diffusion distance. Uh, okay, so what is this project I'm talking about? It all started with a conversation I had a little over 10 years ago with Yuka Jernval, who is an evolutionary anthropologist and also a paleontologist uh, who uses biological morphology. So um, what, what, uh, what that means is that uh, these are biologists who look at the morphology of organisms, in this case, teeth and, teeth and bones of, uh, uh, of animals, mostly mammals, um, that, uh, and they look at both uh, still living uh, species and uh, some that are extinct. And they want, like many biologists, want to study uh, evolution. And of course, they know just much better than I do, and we all do, that uh, um, evolution is governed by how traits are transmitted via DNA. Well, we also now know about, uh, uh, um, about not just the DNA, but the methylation and, and so on, how traits can, can be transmitted. We are understanding that better. But still, uh, they nevertheless, they don't look at this, this, micro, uh, this microscopic level. They study via the organism because evolution is driven by pressures on the animals that, uh, uh, that, that then uh, uh, give, give rise to selection. And selection can come from many, many different uh, origins. But in any case, it's, it's selection that for these large uh, organisms acts on the organism and is then after selection takes place is then uh, uh, transmitted via these, these uh, DNA mechanisms. But um, in order to understand the, the, the evolutionary pressure, you need to look at the organism and its interplay with its surroundings and other uh, individuals in its species and other species. And uh, so that's a reason to, even in this, this 21st century, still use uh, uh, morphology. But of course, morphology has done a, uh, has, has uh, made many, a lot of progress since the 19th century. So uh, right now we are mostly working with Doug Boyer, who was a postdoc of Yuka Jernvalls at the time that uh, I, I, I talked with Yuka. Um, but uh, by happenstance, uh, Doug Boyer uh, became a faculty member and obtained tenure at Duke University. So we are colleagues, two buildings apart. And so, of course, that makes this collaboration much easier. Although in these remote uh, uh, times, it, it's, uh, it's, we're just as distant as I would be from Yuka, who is in Finland, except for time changes. OK, collaborators. So there's Doug here. Um, then I have a number of, 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 of uh, former students who are in uh, different places. Uh, Teng Wan Gao actually moved uh, after he finished at Duke, moved to the University of Chicago. Um, I have some who have left. Uh, Jesus uh, uh, works now in, in, in finance. Um, and then here are uh, Shahar Kowalski and uh, Shanshan, I've already quoted. Um, and uh, Shahar Kowalski and Nadav Dim are, uh, uh, Shahar just moved to UNC, Nadav is still a postdoc. These are the two people in, 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 in my group who, who are really optimizers and they have done beautiful work independent of this collaboration on optimization. And um, you should check their websites and maybe invite them to your seminar. Uh, okay, so what, what was the collaboration about? So um, it was first, the, the first conversation I had with Yuka was uh, uh, 
about the complexity of these. So he told me when he heard I was a mathematician, we met at a social event of all things, uh, that uh, he had recently had a very uh, impactful paper in which they showed a high correlation between the complexity of uh, uh, molars, molar teeth of uh, of mammals, with uh, their diet, and it was a remarkable thing because uh, the the uh, they did a detailed measurement of complexity of these teeth, and they could then not only see whether. Uh, uh, an animal was a, a carnivore or an herbivore, but they could see whether, uh, if an herbivore, where they were mostly leaf or, or, or fruit eaters, or in carnivores, whether they they eat ate insects or or uh, and not only that or 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 uh, warm-blooded meat. Um, not only that, they could also. Um, uh, it, it also was something that held regardless of the uh, size of the animal. So it worked as well for shrews, which are tiny little things uh, that eat insects, as for elephants. So it was extremely useful. And since it held along this, uh, uh, in this wide group of existent animals, that made it really useful for paleontology because that meant you could then infer from the observation you had done uh, on, on, on the existing animals, uh, back to the past and do it for uh, the uh, fossils. Because for existing animals, we have a ground truth. We know what they eat. And if you find this correlation, then you can use that in order to infer what these fossils, uh, what the animals that, that gave rise to the fossils ate, for which you may not, you typically do not have that information. OK, so I asked him, well, how do you measure complexity of teeth? And he said, well, we take a leaf from, uh, so we're talking now, uh, I mean, about 12, 13 years ago. We take a leaf from what computer graphics people do. When they have a surface and they render it, uh, they uh, often, uh, uh, in order to give a good impression of the two dimensional, the three dimensionality on a two dimensional screen, even if you can't move it, they put lights in different places, a red light, a blue light, and a white light. And from the different shadings that you get that are colored on the screen, we infer uh, uh, the three-dimensionality. And so we realized that we could uh, uh, look at complexity by putting lights like that in a rendering and then take a snapshot and look at a fine triangulation and look at color transitions. And we typically put more than three lights and so on. And so we look at this, this optical uh, color transitions and we count that and we quantify that. I said, but what you're doing is really thinking of a, a, a vector normal to the surface and you look how that changes in direction. And I said, yes. I said, well, we know how to compute that in computational geometry and there exist good algorithms for that. And maybe that would do better than uh, counting these color transitions. And so we decided to try that. And I had then Yaron Lipman, who is now a full professor at Weizmann Institute, as my postdoc. And um, he was delighted because he works on optimal, on, 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 uh, on, on uh, well, optimization and machine learning now, but at the time also on mostly on, on uh, computational geometry. Um, and uh, because it was delighted because most of the applications of uh, for, that you see at SIGGRAPH, for instance, are applications to uh, problems that come from video games or, or from, uh, from uh, digital movies, digitized movies like Pixar. And, and, and here there was a science application. And so that felt uh, so much more uh, serious as a scientist. So um, he, what he did, but in a sense, it was like a, not quite off the shelf. I mean, we took the mathematics that existed and the programs that existed and adapted them to this particular situation. And indeed, that gave rise to a very good way of measuring it, which has since been updated to uh, by Shan Shan to go to work for a much wider range of parameters than we originally had uh, designed it for. And that is used standardly by uh, uh, biological morphologists. But the fact that we had that we showed our, 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 our usefulness, then led to a question that was much, much more complex and that uh, we are still, in a sense, working on, well, it has evolved. So the original question was, 
how can you find a way to compute distances between surfaces without landmarks? So first I have to explain to you how, what, well, here you see what the data look like and then how Procostas distance works. So here is uh, our different, it's the same data set. Uh, uh, it's a, uh, uh, this is the way in which typically the data that we get are acquired on these molars. So um, these are, usually these are small animals. And so they, um, their, their, their teeth are even smaller, of course. And they uh, get scanned um, in micro CT. Um, these surfaces, the, the, we get out of that a surface that can get triangulated and then you see it rendered here and we sometimes put on a, a texture in order to compare uh, uh, different surfaces. You might ask why, for heaven's sake, teeth have a 3D structure. I mean, and in the 3D there's a lot of biology too. Why do you only look at the surface? Well, that's because for many of the teeth we study, we only have the surface. Not that people find only surfaces, no. But uh, fossils, especially rare fossils, are things that, that people don't lend easily to other labs. Um, and uh, Doug Boyer uh, uh, recognized this uh, a long time ago. And in all his, his whole career, wherever he goes, he tries to visit uh, a local repository of, his, of, of, of uh, fossils. And he developed a, he used a technique of, of a dental technique with very fine resins to obtain casts and to make casts of these fossils. And because he's an expert and, and people trust him, I mean, he's a biologist, they will let him take casts of these fossils that they will not let leave their, their collection. And so he has an extensive collection of casts of teeth. And of course, then you have lost all the 3D, we just have the surfaces. And that's why we work. So often the, the scans is from those casts and not from the tooth itself. Okay, so how does uh, the Procostas distance work? Well, typically when uh, uh, people want to quantify distances, they actually want to do that in the context of a question they want to answer. And so they, uh, they, they put landmarks on, on, on uh, the teeth that uh, are relevant to that question. And they have a whole collection, typically they have a whole collection of things that they want to compare. And uh, they look at landmarks that they see are homologous, so corresponding biologically on all of these teeth, and they put those landmarks on each one of those teeth. So here you have a number of teeth, of landmarks on this, this, this particular uh, uh, primate. The, uh, you can then use the spatial coordinates of the landmarks. So that gives you 3K numbers. And those will represent that shape in, 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 uh, in space. So you have now an R3K uh, uh, vector. And here you have all those landmarks on a family of, 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 of teeth corresponding. And you see the yellow points and the green and so on. Note here that not everything is a, a, a geometric uh, place that we would, that I, as, as somebody who, who doesn't know much about teeth still, after all those years, uh, would, would select. I mean, uh, and, and so we would ask them, uh, why do you take this bump and not that? And here there's a, a, is a notch and, and, and you don't mark it and, and so on. So there's a whole lot, and they all have, they have very good answers to all those questions. And uh, so, so uh, we, we, there's a whole lot of domain knowledge that goes into that. And it became very clear that that domain knowledge comes from their immense background because they know so many teeth and they know already about evolution and about what corresponds and so on. So there was, it was clear from the start that there was going to be information in the collection that was not going to be obvious or even inferable at all if you just this pairwise con uh, uh, comparisons. Okay, so we store that in the back of our minds, but uh, how does Procrustes distance work now? So you, uh, what, what short, you- Short question, sorry. Yes. So they do this by hand or there is an algorithm? Uh, so uh, no, they, they typically do this by hand. Of course, now they do this by hand on computers. They have three, they, they have these models on the computer and they rotate them and so on, and they mark these points. 
and uh, but they do that typically this is done by hand absolutely okay. and one of the things is that we now have methods by which it can be done automatically that they actually like i mean so i'll get to that but this was done by hand and then what you do in order to find the process distance is you take all these these uh, k tuples of of points and you orient you move one so that it's as close a uh, 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 a correspondence to another one and then you take the sum of the squares of the of of, of the distances in that correspond the yellow distances the, the the plus the blue distances plus and so on and that's the distance between two of these shapes so that's what's called the procrustes distance so this has uh, uh the landmarks and the procrustes distance has some limitations first of all it's tedious and time consuming to mark these things uh, and so, and typically, uh, they they mark just as many as they need in order to get some, some statistically significant signal. So there are a great many samples in collections in museums and elsewhere that have never been 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 used because well, you have more than you need for this this for a project, and so it would be wonderful if they were all marked and everything could be used. Uh, uh, also, because you take the sum of all the distances of the yellow points and the blue points and the, and the green points, you have to have the same number of landmarks in your collection for the question you want to answer. So, um, if, if one of your teeth, especially if it's fossil, that's very, and so one has a piece broken off, that means that you can't use any information about that part of it anywhere because you can't put a point there. Um, you need, in order to do this marking, uh, a high degree of expertise. And that means that uh, even though data or biologists like everybody else more and more put their data online and make it available, uh, Doug Boyer started uh, something that's called Morphosource, where people upload uh, uh, data and can compare. And so people who work on shoes can find data of many, many other animals and so on. So although the data are available, you still need all that expertise about the species or the, the group of species you're looking at in order to be able to mark them. So it would be great to develop tools that would not need that so that you could uh, uh, more easily access uh, and, and use data that are not in your, your particular corner. And then in some cases, even uh, experts will debate about the location of a particular uh, point. So, uh, so they wanted to, to, to get around all that. And um, so, as I said, the procrustes distance is, uh, you have these points with, on one surface, the axis, on another surface, the y's. You move the axis so that they're as close as possible, so you minimize over all rigid transformations. And then you take the sum of the squares of distances. Now, uh, we wanted to do that automatically. So, um, and for these triangulated surfaces, typically they're very finely triangulated. This is, a, I believe, a mouse lemur teeth tooth. So we are talking about an animal that's about, uh, I don't know, eight centimeters long. And this is the second molar. So you can imagine how small it is. And it is extremely finely digitized, uh, finely discretized. Um, so we actually, so this is the work we started. We defined two different distances. Uh, one that I actually liked mathematically more, and the other one that uh, we we uh, that turned out to be more successful and that we're using, which is which is inspired by the procrustes distance. Okay, so let me describe both of you to them. So in uh, in the, the first distance, we use conformal flattening. Now, one 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 little uh, caveat here: biologists, when they hear mathematicians talk about conformal, immediately start becoming very apprehensive because. Conformal arguments, it's beautiful geometry, but have been used more than biologists uh, care to see them used. And, and although they are sometimes uh, applicable, um, they say biology doesn't behave conformally and so on and so on. We do not use it at all meet for a biological reason. We just use it to go from 2D surface in 3D to a 2D representation that's flat. I mean, and that means that our search space for maps will be much easier. That's all. Um, OK, so if you have two teeth, then by, by conformal flattening, they're this type surfaces. We can also deal with, with other uh, topologies, but this type surfaces. In the conformal flattening, the conformal factor becomes a 
a function on the disk and uh, we want to compare those. But we want to compare those in a conformally uh, uh, invariant way because of course, even the same tooth can be conformally flattened in different ways and that will give rise to a different landscape of conformal factor. Okay, so we need to, uh, so, and uh, we dare use uh, uh, some transport notions in order to compare those. So we, the, the idea is, and again, we were inspired by what biologists do. Biologists do take uh, the local behavior of, of the, the landscape around the point in order to correspond them, but then they also look at the whole organization of the whole. So we're going to take the local behavior uh, so we look at little conformal neighborhoods. We should have, there should have been circles here, but, uh, um, and, and to compare them, we conformally uh, move them to the center. Then we have now two situations where we have to look at the local conformal factor around the two centers. And um, the, only, the only map, the only degree of freedom that the conform, uh, conformal flattening still has is that one could be rotated from the other. So we uh, take the best correspondence between the two uh, uh, up to rotation for a disk of, of radius r here. That gives us a, a local similarity or dissimilarity, if you want, of two points. And then we use that as a map, as, as a distance to do uh, a Wasserstein uh, optimization. We look, at, we look at all the possible uh, 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 the possible transport, uh, all the possible measures that have uh, the, the two mu and nu as their marginals and uh, uh, take the infimum of the integral of the distance. So that's the global organization that comes in. And that defined us the conformal Wasserstein neighborhood distance. And I think it's a beautiful mathematical uh, concept and that was one candidate, but it was computationally quite heavy. So we also, decided to, in order to get something that was computationally a little less heavy, a continuous procrustis distance. So in procrustis distance, you start with a correspondence between points. Now we don't have points that are already marked. This one is the two corresponding yellow points and these are the two red ones and these are the two green ones. We just have points. We, have, we take many more, let's say we take a thousand on one surface and a thousand on the other surface. Now. Typically, you try to distribute your thousand very well. You could say that that means that if you were to take the Voronoi cell of your thousand points, the Voronoi cells are about the same in, in, in area all. So each point corresponds to one thousandth of the full area. We always normalize our areas to one because we want something that's independent of scale, remember? So we have a surface of area one and each one has one thousandth. And on the other surface, we do that too. And now we are going to put correspondences. So what that really means is that implicitly in our methods, we are looking at things that preserve area because they're going to take a Voronoi cell to another Voronoi cell and they all have about 1,000th of the area. So um, there's nothing special about area preserving. The biologist said, we don't expect that to do. You say, we said, don't worry. We'll only use this for things that are very close together. We won't need distances that are very far together. I mean, they still didn't know very much about diffusion distances, and so they were very apprehensive, but we said, don't worry, don't worry. So, and for species that are very close, it is indeed, I mean, it's close to isometric, it's close to error preserving and so on. So we decide, let's be, in order to make a mathematical definition, you have to have uh, some way of doing the correspondence. Okay, and, um, we wanted it continuous also the feomorphism. And then we said, let's minimize over all the rigid transformations. Now, we just took an arbitrary correspondence. You should probably take the best one. So uh, here this is illustrated, I have with two curves. So I have this blue and this, this orange curve and I've taken some correspondence. And then for that fixed correspondence, I orient one so that I get the best possible uh, 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 distance. So I've minimized R here. But it's pretty clear that my correspondence wasn't very smartly chosen in the first place. So in fact, the best R would give me, the best C 
correspondence would give me a much smaller distance. So I also infim, uh, take the infimum in this class. And because we, in, we take an infimum over a class here, we have to define a class over which we are going to take the infimum. So this is a well-defined mathematical object about which we actually can prove interesting, pro uh, interesting uh, properties. In particular, we could prove, which was very useful uh, in practice, that if this distance is small, then the minimizer area preserving the fermorphism is very close to conformal, but only if it's small. And that meant that we didn't have to search this unwieldy space of area preserving things. We just searched the conformal because then we would be close. And so we could prove beautiful theorems about that. And so that was uh, good. Um, and not only that, but it, it and some, that is something that, that uh, the biologists in hindsight, uh, and I'll come back to that, really liked, that we got a, uh, uh, a correspondence map C out of this, namely the one that minimized it. Okay, so we had these two different distances. We had agreed, when you work with biologists, I have learned that uh, uh, they have a well-defined protocol on how to work. So yes, you can explore things and formulate hypotheses based on your observations, but then you do an experiment to test this hypothesis. And when you do that, you define ahead of time what success will be. You say, I will declare this successful if I measure that and it does that. Okay, so we had defined ahead of time that we would uh, look at, at uh, uh, the distances compared, the Procrustes distance that was done by observer uh, uh, designated landmark placement, ODLP, and our distances, and we would look at the matrix of these. The, 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 the samples here, this was a wide range of mammals, uh, are sampled, uh, uh, are labeled so that things that are closely related have labels that are close. So, um, so we said uh, uh, we want to especially look at structure near the diagonal. We did that for the two distances we had. And indeed, if you then look near the diagonal, I have two blow ups. You see that the continuous procrustes distance actually does a better job at preserving the structure near the diagonal than the uh, the, the, the displacement, the landmark displacement, uh, the, the, the observer uh, uh, decided landmark placement, sorry. So that was one way. And uh, another way was we were going to look at how landmarks were transformed from one to the next. And then uh, uh, the way the quantify, uh, in order to see whether we had biological signal really in our matrices, in our distances, we decided that we would try based on the teeth, on, on, on what we looked, what we found, try to classify things to cluster families in, in, in genera and, and so on. And, and, and uh, sorry, species into uh, genera and genera into families and so on. And um, whether we could do that as well with our distances as with their uh, uh, landmark uh, based distances. Not that the landmark based distances are how people would cluster into species these days. Of course not. That's what Cuvier might have done in the 19th century based on one tooth. Uh, uh, but but uh, in order to see what biological signal we preserved, we did that comparison. And uh, we were much more successful than the biologists had expected. And this we, they were very enthusiastic. It became a very nice paper. Uh, uh, it was published in PNAS. Um, and, and it gave us uh, 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 a way of making mappies, mappings that were uh, uh, independent of, 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 of landmark placement. And um, so they were very happy. We were even more happy when we, after, uh, uh, when we realized that by taking the small distances seriously and doing diffusion uh, 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 mapping on this, we actually clustered even more tightly. And this was the beginning of their believing us when, when we said small distances are much more informative than the large distances, and we can knit them together through this method. Um, the funny thing was that 
so they had the mapping. We had a, a period of about a year and a half where we made no progress at all. And the reason was that every time we, we talked together, um, they would they would come up with, with problems. They said, look, this correspondence between these two T's, we are not happy with at all because of this and this and this and that. And it took a while of these discussions and, and mounting frustration um, before I realized that in fact, because of the collaboration, their perception of what we could do and of what might be attainable had changed. And when I started articulating that, in fact, they really became now much more interested in the mappings than in the distances. Um, and they agreed with that, that we could make progress again. So we changed, I mean, although it had been trying to find better ways of computing distances, we now are looking, going to look at these mappings. Could we find from the whole collection a better way of making the mappings. So in a sense, we were going to now get back to the placing landmarks, but doing it automatically if we go to the mappings, um, rather than just the distances for statistical analysis. And that's when, when the collaboration started up again, when, when, I mean, started making progress again, when we started concentrating on the mappings, because that's what they wanted. Now, I showed you this, this clustering. Uh, then uh, about uh, five, six years ago, we actually realized that Ting Ran Gao uh, realized that we do much better. And in fact, you can, and that's a method I'm going to explain now, uh, those same species, again, we start from the same teeth and we take the continuous procrustis distance and the correspondences that we got, and you can actually get to, uh, to this Okay, how do we do that? How did he do that? Well, he realized that to do the diffusion distance, we use local distances, we knit them together, we get spectral parameterization, and that gives us a distance. Fine. But in this whole process, we had, so we compute these distances, dij, between pairs, based on the uh, 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 continuous procrustis map that we identify, but we use the map only to find that distance. And then we forget about it. We have this beautiful, lots of information holding correspondence and we only use it to compute that one number. Can we use it more fully? Uh, so yes, because in fact, you could say that the manifold we want to explore is the collection of teeth and how they're situated with respect to each other. But each tooth is a two-dimensional surface, and we have correspondences. So we have a fiber bundle. And uh, well, fiber bundles. So that is typically what you get when, 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 when you, you have a base manifold, and you imagine hair growing there, and you have correspondence between all these, these fibers. And so that's what Ting Ran Gao did. He said, let's use this whole structure and then only later go down to what you get on the base manifold. So a little, a few slides for about fiber bundles. I mean, just, just to recall to those of you who've seen them before uh, what they are, actually I became, I was quite surprised because I had learned fiber bundles as a grad, about fiber bundles as a grad student. And now I was returning to them more than a quarter century later and they had changed considerably. I mean, because people have found ways of looking at them. But in fact, our fiber bundles are very nonlinear. And so uh, the old way of looking at it is... is uh... Okay, in a fiber bundle, you have a base manifold. And for each point on the base manifold, you have a, uh, a, a, a fiber. And the best way of looking at that is saying that you have a mapping from the full manifold to M. Uh, so the bundle projection going down from the fiber, each at each point, the inverse image of 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 uh, in the fiber in the in the base manifold, the inverse is a uh, corresponds to a fiber, and there's some local triviality. If you take a very small set here, then it looks like a kind of uh, in this case a kind of rectangle, a product set, but uniformly it doesn't, and so the Möbius. Uh, uh, ring is a, uh, a fiber bundle, but that, that locally looks like a cylinder, but not globally. 
many fiber bundles exist. People have looked at, at uh, tangent bundles. Here you have the unit uh, uh, tangent bundle. Here you have a very simple uh, uh, different, different bundle on a circle. So we have R. We assume a base manifold of our teeth. We have uh, 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 our, our, our uh, we want these correspondences. What we have is on our fibers, we have these correspondences and we have them at many different levels. So we have a whole lot of different views of the, of the diffusion, but we can also diffuse on the fibers. And so we can define a diffusion on the entire bundle that has local diffusion and uh, a horizontal diffusion. The vertical diffusion is governed in, we get an inkling of it when we try to make our correspondence maps because points of course are not going to correspond exactly. They're going to land somewhere in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a, a, a triangle. And that gives you an idea of, 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 of diffusion. I mean, so that's all exploited in the method and I can't go into details. But once you've done that, you can then do a spectral uh, um, representation of the full diffusion. Uh, one thing that is a little bit something that we still have to work at and understand better, we, we got a good understanding if we, we do diffusion methods for just a simple manifold of how to fix, how to find a tau. But here, since we will have diffusion on the base manifold as well as on the fibers, we have to find the relative importance of those. And we're still exploring uh, the importance of, of the sampling density on both, on how to best choose the ratio of those parameters. But those are technical details that I'll leave in the middle for now. Once you do that, you can do eigenvectors again. And these eigenvectors will have points representing, since you have the whole, the whole bundle, so you have points representing uh, different surfaces. Now note, I don't need correspond that, that different surfaces have the same number of points here. This was something biologists were absolutely delighted by. I'm not making a mapping. I will make the mapping later. I, I, for the moment, I just have uh, my eigenvectors. And now you can do many things. For instance, uh, you could just take the first uh, the three non-trivial eigenvectors. That will give you a representation of these teeth in three space. If you do that for very closely related species, this is what, what, what you get. Each one of them gives you a, a kind of manifold and they actually turn out to all sit on the same surface in 3D, which makes it possible to do registration better. Because of course, as I said, a blue point doesn't coincide with a green point. But what you can now do is take this red point, see where it lands in relation to the nearest blue points and say, oh, it's this very, very very metric uh, uh, um, uh, combination of those blue points. So I'll map my blue point to that same barometric representation of the blue points here on the tooth. And we have much better mappings to the point that our, uh, I, we, we have the cr uh, continuous procrustis mappings. So CP mappings, we call them. So from continuous procrustis, they became the crappy mappings because they're the first mappings we start with, but then we have this much better mappings that we get from this. You can, you could decide, and this actually has been used by our biological collaborators for, for some of their work, you could decide to just take that whole cloud of zillions of points in, on the bundle and cluster them in, in once you've done the spectral uh, decomposition. So we're not uh, going to the base manifold yet. We're still on the full bundle. Cluster them, let's say, in 12 zones. And then you find that the zones I mean, first of all, they land up nicely in zones on the different teeth. Nothing forced them to do that, but they do. And then uh, they, the zones biologically correspond. And some zones, like for instance, this zone here is large on some teeth and kind of tiny on others. So they really, really like that. The fact that we no longer were, I mean, we did never imposed 
uh, uh, conservation of area over long distance because we were always approximate and the approximation, uh, the, the, the error accumulated if you with many small hops, but itself was no longer uh, flexible because of, of approximation error, but in, in its own way. Uh, you can also, and that's say, look, all the portions on this red tooth give me an idea of the geometry of the, the, the spectral representation on the red tooth and, and so on. And you can then make a summary of those. So in a certain sense, uh, factor out all the geometric information here in order to retain only the uh, relationship, the geometric information between the different spectral vectors as the red tooth is concerned. So I have integrated out all the red variables here and I can do that at every level. And then I can use that in order to project down to a geometry at the base manifold level. So that's what, what and so you can then find a horizontal corresponding distance and that's what gave rise to this. Uh, now this, this clustering. Now, Bowler just said, oh my God, they said, oh, look at that. And then they said, we're crestfallen. They said, oh, but it's not really like a phylogenetic tree. I mean, because uh, you see the, uh, yes, the, the uh, you find some clustering that's interesting. Uh, red and green are not so far, but on the other hand, uh, blue and, and, and purple are put together here while they are among these five species the least connected. But of course, we've only looked at their molar. You can't expect to get a phylogenetic tree. What in fact we were getting, oops, oh, I don't see it. I, uh, yeah, what we were getting is what they ate. The folivores were together, the frugivores were together, and the insectivore was different. At a very finely calibrated way, of inferring information, biologically important information from these teeth. And so that was, uh... okay, now I claim and uh, that I believe that this method will apply much more generally because very, very, very often when you look at diffusion, you want to look at similarity of things. So here I've taken examples from the, uh, the MNIST data set of digits. Uh, you have things that have a lot of structure. And yes, you make a distance between them and you do fusion, but why not use the structure? So here you could look at, at for instance, these three pairs and compute, and I've color coded here in rainbow colors, correspondence maps. And I could do the same with that. And it's not very, very clear, but here on the left, I have a clustering of a group of ones and sixes just based on diffusion distances. And here is a, a separation of them based on what you would get from a horizontal diffusion. Um, we did that for a small collection of them because, well, it's computationally intensive and we still have to optimize these things. But you see, we do get a better separation. Uh, another group of ones and sixes. Here, a group of several digits. And again, I feel that we get, I mean, this was just a sanity check of, have we done something that only works for the second molars of certain primates, or do we have a general principle? And uh, with Chan Chan and, and Ting Ranam, we've been working on, 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 on doing many more examples and developing some, some theory for the whole thing. Um, and we'd want to do many, many more things because uh, we want to do this in a multi-resolution way. We want to look back over the whole tree, phylogenetic tree. I mean, these are, crab-eating seals. Now, crab-eating seals actually don't eat crabs. They, they use these teeth to filter out krill from, uh, 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 from, from water, in that krill-rich water that they, 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 they take a big swallow and then they spew out the water keeping the krill and that's what they eat. There's to find simple correspondence maps between a tooth that of, uh, like these crab-eating seals and teeth here on the, on the, on the left. So it's clear that we can't hope to do this at the very fine resolution ever. But what I believe is will be a, a way of doing is that as we go back, as the, the, the relationship between species are further back in the, uh, in the phylogenetic tree, we have to also 
matrices and define our correspondence maps at that at that level. So we'll do we'll have to do a kind of fine uh, 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 multi-resolution uh, uh, fiber bundle kind of way of doing. And uh, I asked geometers of my acquaintance where they could tell me what what to read in order to learn about that, and they said it doesn't exist. So we'll have to develop it. So uh, that's the end of my talk. So. Uh, Thank you very much for, for a great talk yeah, with a very nice uh, application from biology and uh, yeah, with uh, new methods developed yeah, in applied mathematics. So it is uh, time for questions. Yes. Yes, let me see. So just please. Uh, Unmute your microphone or uh, yeah, raised hands. So then, yeah, let me ask the first question. So you introduced this, this new distances or the, the, there, are, there were two different notions and uh, you used them for, for clustering. But what about doing some virus analysis like, uh, yeah, calculated derivatives or as, as uh, people doing optimization with, with, with these kind of objects? Uh, well, we, the, the thing is, and we, we also wanted to do machine learning, for instance, uh, the, the, the thing is that you don't have very many samples on your base manifold. I mean, at present, we don't. Uh, we, we typically, uh, they will uh, already, it's, we have to insist to get several specimens of a species. I mean, uh, uh, but but they typically like to compare several species, and uh, so uh, each one of the teeth has very nice resolution. But on the base manifold, you don't have enormous resolution. Uh, so we that, that's one reason why we want to to uh, work towards making the methods faster and and so on. And actually. Uh, Rob Ravier, one of the people I showed in the list of collaborations, is, is really doing a fantastic job in up methods and so that they can be used. But so for many of the methods you would like, you, you have good tools, you typically need many more samples on the, on, uh, in this, on the species level than we have. We do not have the, the uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or we will never have that you need for for uh, for machine learning to, to to do this for the moment we work we, we work on 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 tens or or maybe hundreds at best i mean in the, in the low hundreds uh so we don't have the resolution there to do on the other hand we have become uh, uh our our correspondences are getting so good and so believable uh for the biologists i mean so one thing we thought is if we can good mappings do good mappings, then we should be good at interpolating, at making fictitious teeth in between. In the beginning, our methods uh, were, would uh, th uh, produce things that biologists would look at and say, nah. But now, right now, they say, oh my god, this really looks like if I found this in the field, yes, I would. Uh. So we are good, starting to become good at resampling the manifold. And so we're getting to places where we can start using those methods. And in fact, we are looking now at, at, at uh, uh, doing things geodesically on the manifold. I mean, and, and, and looking at, uh, starting to look at, at things that will have higher order accuracy. Uh, so with derivatives and, and, and uh, so, okay. but we're okay. just in the beginning of that. Okay, great, thank you. Then uh, since I'm, yeah, kind of uh, working in non-smooth optimization and uh, particular with non-smooth objects, is, uh, is okay can this method uh, reproduce in a good way let's say non smoothness in the in the in the objects you are, you are looking at uh, I, I believe that uh, in in the fibers we should if, if we if we want to look at things that correspond and that have non smooth places yeah. that should be not a problem i okay. mean uh, uh, that that uh, uh, it, it might be that we need to label those places specially mm -hmm. or that it will come out of the analysis. I don't know about that. We haven't tried. But um, I think if there's non-smooth 
correctness in, in the base manifold, that I have no idea how we would deal with that. And in a sense, we will have to, because uh, of course, basically in biology, you don't really have a manifold. You have, uh, everything is a leaf of a tree. And, and uh, so who, who tells you that to get manifold? So what I believe in, again, the multi-resolution thing will, will play a role there. Is is that that uh, you cannot the crab eating seals and 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 the primates will not be leaves on 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 uh, will not be on the same manifold. We will have things that are uh, different locally. Uh, species here will be close to to uh, a manifold, and then. Uh, if, if you want to go to more distant things, it's only by going to a coarser approximation yes. where things are very similar that you can make a manifold approximation. And yes. So, I mean, in fact, even, even for, yeah, for the, uh, I mean, of course, probably this can be extended also to, to other biological objects. I, I believe that, yeah, I mean, this is one area, but these questions are relevant also to other fields, but oh, even, absolutely. Even even for for this uh, particular instance, since probably there is some some non smoothness there, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, absolutely. I think we, we we will need to deal with that. And also, I think we uh, so some of the models that we are trying to look at in 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 to simulate uh, this 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 fiber bundle structure and mm -hmm. and and look at its properties have non smoothness in them. So, uh, but 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 as I said, that's still and being worked on and we, we, we are not there yet. So uh, another question, do the mathematics uh, you are developing? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, just like we uh, do not understand the full biology. I still haven't learned, you know, all these different things on uh, yeah. uh, meta starlet and antoconit. I mean, I've learned the names. I, I can I can just drop a few names and I don't know what they mean. Uh, uh, I haven't become a biologist. My students have actually uh, gotten more into it, and they 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 they, they know families and species and, and so on. But still, I mean, uh, but we get enough into it that we know what they care about. I mean, and that we start, and so they have understood enough that they understand the basic principles of the fiber bundle and, and yes. that, I mean, and, and they really got into the diffusion once we showed them that diffusion distances did so much better with the same data when they understood them. And also we, we both of us have become very good at, at trying to find images that will work for the other. We meet on average once a week. We meet when, 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 when the biologists are not in the field where they have no internet, we meet once a week. Uh, we continue to to do that now by Zoom, uh, uh, and and uh, and we, we it it's been um, this sustained dialogue has played a big role, and 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 the will to try to to uh, find things uh, to to break through when there were obstacles in the dialogue is something that has to exist on both sides, and and uh, I I mean. I've worked in interdisciplinary collaborations with a num in a number of different fields. And whenever I find somebody with whom that dialogue works well, I really treasure it because it gives rise to very, very interesting questions that are different than the ones that we would imagine for ourselves. And that can give rise to really interesting mathematical development. That's something that I strongly believe and I still do. And, uh, and I've, it has worked for me. So it, it, uh, it's a great application. Yeah? I mean, uh, not so much usual. I mean, yeah, in, in, a, in, a, in a very interesting field. So thank you very much for your talk. Yeah? It was well. our great pleasure yeah, to have you in our seminar. So just I'd like to announce the participants that we will post the video and the slides on our website. And uh, thank you again, Professor Dobeshi. It was uh, our great pleasure to, to have you here as well, our speaker. Thank you for asking me and for your interest. Wish you all the best. Yeah? And okay, uh, we hope, hopefully, we will meet uh, soon yeah, in, in, in yeah. real in Vienna. Let's, okay? That's right. Okay. I, will, I always love to visit Vienna. Okay. okay. Thank you. So all okay. the best. Thank you very much. Just would like to announce that the next speaker will be Aso Staglar from MIT next Monday. So have a nice week. All the best. And uh, see you soon. <laughs>